Hello and welcome to an APH Access Academy. Today is Global Accessibility Awareness Day 2021. And I am going to introduce Ty Tomasi. She is here with you today to present. Hi, Ty. Good morning, everyone. Um, before we get started, I just wanted to make sure we are recording. Are we recording, Leanne? You are recording. You're good Okay, to go. wonderful. Excellent. Well, thanks, everyone. I've been hearing all the chat coming in on who is here and what your job titles are or not, what kind, what you, what you're doing with, what keeps you busy, whether or not you're working in the field. Um, welcome today. Um, today is a great day to um, celebrate accessibility. Um, as I said, this is, my name is Ty Tomasi. I am the recently hired director of accessibility, diversity, and inclusion here at the American Printing House for the Blind. And um, just a little background about me. I've um, spent a lot of time working in the blindness field in blindness programs for youth and adults. Um, mostly teenagers, uh, people getting ready to work and helping them get jobs. And then I've also worked as an attorney. Um, I would be classified as low vision, although I, I identify as blind. Um, personally, for me, I prefer identity first language, so I call myself blind. Um, and so I'm going to be sharing some information today about accessibility. Um, and as we heard earlier, our opening word was beautiful because accessibility is beautiful and we want to encourage everyone who's building new products and services and websites to create them beautifully with accessibility in mind from the beginning. So my first uh, slide is a picture of me. I'm smiling and it has my name and it has the APH logo on the slide. And if you are looking at your PDF version at some point in the future, um, it has descriptions there for you. So we want to talk about moving toward an accessible future. Certainly we have made great strides, but we have a long way to go. And so today we're wanting to have a little gratitude for what we have done and where we have come to and what we have to do in the future. So as far as our learning objectives today, we're going to learn about items and software that improve accessibility for the blind and visually impaired community. Um, we're gonna understand a little bit more about how to make social media posts more accessible. Um, we won't be able to go very far in depth on that, but I do want to encourage you to send questions to me here at APH, um, and my contact information will be included. We also have an email address that is accessibility at APH.org. That's a very easy one to remember, so you can use that anytime. Um, we're also going to talk about resources for making presentations and documents more accessible. We're going to learn how to expand our accessibility knowledge and continue that work going to the next slide. So like I said earlier, I just I want to take some time today to reflect a little bit and be grateful for what we have achieved in accessibility. We have quite a few great overarching laws that help us with accessibility. We have the Vocational Rehabilitation Act of 1973, which has been amended a few times. And it provides that anybody receiving federal funding needs to make sure that their services are accessible and that people with disabilities are included. We have the Individuals with Disabilities Ed Education Act, which helps us with special education throughout our K through 12 studies. Good morning, Nigeria. <laughs> um, and we have the, um, uh, in, sorry, the Americans with Disabilities Act from 1990, which George H.W. Bush signed. And that is a key law in, in helping with accessibility in the United States for, for every sector um, we have public entities and then also private businesses and government have to uh, have to abide by that. So um, I want to know if you have any accessibility questions, I will either do my best to answer them here if we have if time permits, or perhaps I can answer them for you later. So I urge you to put those into the chat. Um, or if you would like to um, let me know if you have any questions uh, through the chat, that would be great. We can address as many as we can. All right, so some things that make life more accessible for the blind and visually impaired community. I took an informal survey on Facebook in a several different groups and also on my friends page, which has, which has quite a few friends who are blind and visually impaired. And people who responded to my informal survey said that the APH mantis and chameleon braille displays were very helpful. Um, I've found those very helpful myself and we'll get into a little bit more detail about those in upcoming slides. We also found during this last year, especially during the pandemic, that shipped Instacart and Walmart 
delivery applications were extremely helpful for the blind community to get all the items we might need at home when we're stuck in lockdown. Um, I also learned about this cool app called Picture This, and I went outside and used it yesterday. And Picture This is an app that will allow you to take pictures of plants and you can identify them. And someone said one of their greatest joys during the pandemic was gardening. And they were able to get outside and garden and they could differentiate between all the different plants or maybe the weeds that were growing in their garden and they could use this app to, to help them out. I thought that was really neat. All right, more things that make life accessible for the blind and visually impaired. Uh, a friend with, of mine who has quite a bit of vision said that the Google Pixel phone was very helpful to them. I know um, it's also accessible to the totally blind as well. I haven't had a lot of experience with that particular phone, but I hear good things. Um, then we have the IRA Visual Interpretation Service. Um, if you're not familiar with it, you can call a number and get, um, well, connect on an app and get connected with an agent who can help you with visual tasks. Um, and there are very many locations where you can have free service for that with that app. So if you're in a Walgreens, I think if you're in a Target, um, there are quite a few other places where you can get this service for free. And then if you don't, if you're in a location where it's not free, you can pay for a certain number of minutes per month. The opening code is beautiful. Um, sorry, I was just responding to the chat. Um, and then we have the Seeing AI app for identifying different items. It can identify, you're welcome. It can identify different things. It can identify text. It can identify barcodes. Um, it can identify even perhaps handwriting. Someone used it. Someone used the Microsoft Seeing AI app to identify handwriting on a greeting card, which I, I didn't even know was possible. So that's really neat. I was listening to the Microsoft Chief Accessibility Officer. Her name is uh, Jenny Fleury yesterday. And she was talking about how it can help you identify people's faces and what they look like. And it will also try to give you a certain, it will also try to give you an estimation of someone's age. I will tell you that particular feature is not always <laughs> correct, but it, it does its best to, to do that for you. Another one that we have experience with is called Way Around. And Way Around is a labeling system. You can buy different types of labels and put them on all different kinds of things. And they have a great variety of different types of labels, which was really neat to me because a lot of the systems that I've used before have a very limited variety of labels. But this system has magnetic labels, it has washable labels, it has little buttons that you can pin inside of something or you can sew them on. There are all different kinds of things that you can buy to use with the way around system. And you can use it on Android or iPhone and it will, you can scan those items and it will tell you what they are when after you've made a label. So I take one of them, I write a label into my phone, I save it. And then whenever I scan that item, the next time it will tell me what it is. This is particularly helpful for me for clothing, but I know people use it for all kinds of things. And there are even clips, so you could potentially clip them on anything, plants in a garden. Um, you could stick the sticker types on frozen foods. There are, there's just a myriad of different options for that. And that's great because not everybody can use Braille. And so it's a good way to or not everybody is gonna take the time to make the braille labels. And this is, um, it might be quicker. It depends on your, your skill set and what you like to do. All right, and then we also have Voice Dream Reader and Voice Dream Reader is an app that is also available on different smartphones where you can read documents with synthetic speech. And the speech can be better than what you hear on your iPhone. Not always. It depends on your preferences for your voices. One great thing about Voice Dream Reader is you can um, enlarge the text. You can use it with Zoom on the iPhone. Um, you can have it highlight the text that you're reading so you can follow along to make sure you're on the same as at, at the same place that's being read. Um, so you can read aloud and listen at the same time. Then there's also Voice Dream Scanner. And Voice Dream Scanner is an inexpensive way to take a document and read it with your iPhone or your Android phone. Um, you can take a picture of a document and it will read it. Um, the, 
One that we talked about earlier was um, the seeing AI, it can do similar things, um, but I've found this one a little bit more helpful for lengthy documents. Um, so that's something that's really helpful to use. And then of course, Zoom, we're using Zoom right now. So that's indispensable to us um, as far as access to different, different items, different meetings. All right, so now we're gonna go into a few different areas where we use different types of technology. And the first one is education. And so in this section, I'm gonna highlight the APH Mantis, the APH Chameleon, and the APH Juno. Oh, I just heard that somebody said that the Dolphin Easy Reader is also great. So I wanted to put that out there. Um, I also saw someone mentioned Envision AI and um, Cache Reader. So those are all resources that um, you can also look at. I'm sorry, I can't keep up with all the chat, but I will do my best. Those are, those are three great suggestions. All right, so we're gonna go into these um, different APH products here. So the first one is the APH Mantis. And I really like this device. I've been using it for work and it's great because it will help you. Um, you can read braille with it. You can also type on a regular Q-W-E-R-T-Y keyboard. Um, so if you're not great at writing with the braille keyboard, um, you, if you can't use the Braille keyboard, then you can use that. Or if, like me, you feel like you make a lot of mistakes on the Braille keyboard, which I do. For some reason, I feel like when I'm typing with the Braille keyboard, I have more mistakes. Um, I think it might be because I type very fast, and sometimes the Braille keyboard isn't keeping up with my typing, or I'm not pushing one of the keys properly. But in any case, I haven't found my perfect Braille keyboard yet. I'm still on the hunt for that. And um, I like the QWERTY keyboard on the Mantis because I can type a little bit more accurately with it. It's also great for people who are coders, uh, people who do computer programming. It's a little easier to type in those, all those different symbols and numbers. Um, you can do it with the Braille keyboards on other displays. But for me, I, I know that I would be making mistakes like which, which grade of Braille am I in and what, what do I need to push for this? So um, that can definitely be helpful. I also like that it can connect to um, computers and your phone. It can connect to multiple devices. Um, it's got 40 cells of Braille and it has cursor routing keys above each one. So that makes it easy to get to each, to the place that you're typing at to do corrections or insert text. And I think you can connect, connect to five devices if I'm not mistaken. And you can't connect all at once. You have to switch between them, but they can be connected and you can switch between those devices. It's very quick to switch. You can access Bookshare and NFB Newsline, which I really enjoy. Um, there's so many books on Bookshare and it's always great to be able to read different newspapers. And then you can use any smartphone app. When you hook up your Mantis to your smartphone, you can basically access any app that you want. So you can take notes there um, in, your, in your smartphone notes app. Um, it also has internal processor. So you can write, you can edit on, on the Mantis too. You don't have to. You don't have to connect to the iPhone or computer, but it is an option. Next, we're gonna talk about the APH Chameleon. Now I will say this is closest to my ideal Braille keyboard that I've found so far. Oh, I'm glad to hear good feedback about the Mantis in the chat right now. Um, so the APH Chameleon is a great um, Braille display. It's got 20 cells. It's got that Braille keyboard and it is a very well spaced out Braille keyboard. Um, the space bars are down at the bottom, which I quite like. Some of the Braille keyboards that I've used in the past have been a little bit cramped. And so when you're trying to hit the space bar, your, um, your hands, your thumbs are really kind of scrunched in there. And so with the, with the chameleon, they're a little bit spaced out, which is really nice. It's got 20 cells of Braille. Um, it's got colorful cases for kids. Um, so it's kind of, it looks cool if you want to put one of those colorful cases on it. Um, just a bonus, it comes with cute little stickers, which is kind of fun to put on your Braille display and make it kind of personalized for you. And they're tactile stickers. Um, you can, again, switch between multiple devices. You can connect to your smartphone. You can access the same things, Bookshare and Newsline. Uh, very similar functionality, just a smaller display. You can fit it in a large pocket quite nice to be able to carry that around when you're out and about. 
And then we're gonna talk about the APH Juno, which is a new product we have. Um, it's a portable magnifier. It has a seven inch screen. Um, it's got a lot of different magnification options and a lot of different high contrast color options. And it also has OCR, which is optical character recognition. So you can scan, like you can scan something or look at something, you can read it, and then you can have it also read it aloud to you. So if you are struggling to see it or you're not sure exactly what it says, um, you can have the Juno read it to you. So that's a really neat feature. There aren't very many magnifiers that have both of those functions um, installed. It's got, uh, you can take it anywhere. It's very portable and it's small and it's got good, good battery life. All right, so we're moving from education to entertainment. So uh, one of the things that I enjoy um, myself is using an Apple TV. Um, you can use your voice to search for TV programming using Siri. Um, it has the voiceover screen reader, so you can uh, use that just like you do on your iPhone if you use Apple products. You can set it to turn on, you can set it to automatically start your captioning or your audio description, which is really nice. So anytime you encounter a program, a program, I guess that's kind of old school language. Whenever you find a show uh, on there that you want to watch, you can turn on, turn it on and it will just start up when you have already put those preferences on there. Another similar thing like that is the Fire Stick, Amazon Fire Stick. I saw a question about Chameleon. I'm just gonna pop in and answer that. It can be used as a note taker and a braille display. So you can use it as a braille display connected to an external device. You can also use it as a note taker, just like the, uh, just like the Mantis. They do have onboard editors that you can type into. So back to TVs. Uh, TV access. You can use the Fire Stick in a very similar fashion. Um, you know, instead of having Siri, the Fire Stick has Alexa. I hope I didn't trigger anybody's Alexa, right, by saying that. Uh, I'll say the Amazon device. Uh, okay, cost off the top of my head. Oh, Leanne, do you know the costs of the Chameleon and the Mantis off the top of your head? I don't, but I'll get it and I'll put it <laughs> okay, in the Okay, we'll, we'll come and, back to you on that. And if there's that, questions question. you don't want to answer, don't worry, I'll gather them for you. Oh, okay, thank you. I don't know if it's disruptive or helpful to answer the questions as we go, but I will. I'll... It's your presentation. You can do it the way you want. <laughs> okay, okay, I'll do my best. All right, so on, on any of these television options, there's you can access all the on-screen information um, to be able to use that product very well. Um, there are similar functions in Samsung televisions. Um, I know that LG has great functionality and accessibility. And uh, I think that Sony also has great accessibility. I, I have heard anecdotally that Sony doesn't have as great of customer support on those TVs. So that's something to keep in mind, but they do offer accessibility. All right, moving on with more entertainment options. One thing that I've enjoyed using during the pandemic is something called Sonos, that is S-O-N-O-S. -O -O and Sonos is a, a speaker that connects to your internet. Uh, you can get Juno from the APH. Uh, you can order it uh, on quota from us. Uh, Sonos is a, a speaker that you can use on, on the internet and you can play all different kinds of music. The app is completely accessible. You can access all the different assistants with it like Google, um, Siri, Alexa, oh, sorry, not Siri, I guess, Google and Alexa are on there. And what it allows you to do is have a system of all different types of speakers. You can have portable speakers that go with you. You can have larger speakers. You can have a sound bar. And they all can connect and synchronize to an app. So you can actually have multiple speakers in multiple rooms and make your own whole house audio system at a very low cost compared to doing that through other methods. So you can buy one speaker, a year later you can buy another one, you can expand it slowly, but all of that is accessible and you can turn on any music source you want. You can use it with your TV. Um, it's very customizable and I really liked using that because a lot of apps for different speakers and sound um, products are not accessible. So I really enjoyed Sonos. Now we're moving from entertainment to nutrition. You can use Digit Eyes scanner 
um, and that is a barcode reader. So you can receive information by text and voice on your phone. So you can access all the ingredients, the cooking instructions, the nutrition, all of that kind of stuff. And then you can add new information to that product in your own DigitEyes program on your phone so that you can um, add a little bit more than what was on the barcode. And then in, we're gonna to move to home life. Some things that you can use in your home that are accessible are Philips Hue lights, August smart lock, Simply Safe Security System, the Nest Thermostat, and we talked a little bit about the Samsung TV earlier, and robotic vacuums. Um, the ones that I have experience with on this list are the Nest Thermostat and the robotic vacuum. It's nice that you can control these with different apps on your phone, and then you can use Alexa or others uh, assistance to control different devices in your home. That's really nice because those things have been limited for us in the past. We haven't been able to access those items before, and sometimes we needed cited assistance to use them. All right, so we talked a little bit earlier about shopping and assistance. Um, it's really great to be able to use Instacart and Shipped to get items delivered. Uh, you can explore options and compare prices. And then some people also use Money Talks, which is a, an app that keeps track of expenses and balances that APH, that APH makes. Um, you can, you know, track all your financials there. Um, it's really nice to be able to shop from home because you don't have to schedule rides and worry about paratransit and then get your shopping assistant. Yeah, someone said it made grocery delivery a must, not a not a luxury. I agree with that. It's really it was really hard to get into a store at the beginning of the pandemic. I mean, you wouldn't even be able to get help very well because people were afraid to get closer. Now we're on to trip planning. Um, the Expedia and Southwest apps have been very helpful to many people who are blind and visually impaired. You can compare flights uh, from multiple airlines on Expedia. You can read reviews and book hotels. You can get basic information about the destinations. And there's no more waiting on hold. You know, a few years ago, I remember looking into figuring out how to get a flight and there were some airlines who were asking to charge to be able to do that, to charge you to get on the phone with them. So um, there was a time when, when that was a concern. Luckily, a lot of places didn't do that, but I have encountered some places where you call on the phone and they charge you. So not only is this cheap, a cheaper option, but also a more independent option um, to do this. And you don't have to wait on hold anymore to, to get the information. And you, you can have the accessible price comparisons you need and get those tickets on hold. That's gonna be especially helpful in the upcoming months when everybody rushes to travel. I foresee kind of a rush on travel where it's gonna be hard to get into certain places because people are so ready to travel since they've been at home for so long. Other travel um, options that are really helpful are the Soundscape app. This is uh, one that you can use to identify different intersections, bus stops, roads, it kind of describes your location. You can put a, a destination on there and you'll actually get a sound, a directional sound cue, depending on where that place is in relation to your body as you walk. And you can hold the phone uh, flat and explore different options. You don't have to ask for directions as much. Um, and you just, it just allows a lot more independence. Another travel option is Good Maps. This is a new initiative um, that's based here in Louisville. And it is one that's focused more on indoor navigation. So it allows for precise positioning without using beacons. Beacons can be expensive to buy and install. And so now uh, we can use, I think you call this LIDAR, I think that's how it's pronounced, and image uh, recognition. And those things, are automatic. They don't, you don't need to install any special equipment for them. And it allows you to find more fast and accurate 
um, location information. So you can get even closer than you might be able to get with other options, more precise location of where different rooms are and things like that. I'm really looking forward to testing this out. Um, I'm actually working with the Good Maps team to, to get to try it out. So that's something to look forward to. The app is available now. All right, so now we're moving on to making social media more accessible. So I have put up a blog post about making social media accessible. Um, so you can go to this blog post and learn a lot about how to make um, things more accessible. There's quite a bit of information there. I don't think I can get into all of it because there's so many different platforms. But the blog post talks a lot about using simple language, making sure you use color contrast, making sure you do image descriptions on your posts, and it goes into great detail in each of the different social media platforms on how to do that. I'm happy to take questions on that, but I may not be able to get into depth because there's so much to learn there. That's a huge area, and I'm thinking we'll probably do some webinars on this in the future as well, um, but I'm definitely happy to take questions and you can send those to accessibility at aph.org. But in the meantime, here's a post on how to make your posts more accessible. Uh, it also includes some color contrast information that you can use. All right, so now we're on to making presentations more accessible. We did a recent webinar on this. And so we have a link to this webinar that you can access. Um, it goes into great detail about how to make PowerPoints accessible. There are quite a few things. I'm still learning about this. Thanks to Leanne for her help to learn all about it. Um, there's lots of things that you can do to make slides more accessible, um, to make your graphics accessible, to make your text accessible. Um, if I can give you one quick item, don't use text boxes in things because they make things very inaccessible, just a general a general comment. Um, I just saw somebody talking about the photo descriptions in Facebook, and I was very happy to see that now you can, uh, maybe this was something that was already available, but I did not know about it. Now you can override the automatic text description. So when you enter your photo description, it takes out the generalized one that says image might contain a plant. Well, you can put a lot more description on there. Um, which is what I did when I went outside and used that picture this app yesterday to identify a plant in my neighborhood that smelled like lilac. And it was actually um, Japanese honeysuckle. And so I could go on Facebook and post a picture and add some description of the plant. It was pretty neat. So anyway, back to uh, presentations. You can make your PowerPoints accessible with this uh, webinar. And I'm happy to answer questions as we go along. I'm learning right along with you. All right, and then we're gonna talk about making documents more accessible. Now, this is also a huge area of exploration. Uh, there's a lot to learn about how to do that. And uh, there's going to be a, a webinar on this in the APH Hive. We did a webinar on it. It will be available in the Hive pretty soon. So that's pre-recorded for your access uh, later on but it has a great deal of information about making it more visually accessible, making it accessible to screen readers, using those heading levels. Please, please, please use heading levels for us uh, so we can navigate with screen readers much easier through a document. And don't use tabs to make tables. Make a table with the table tool. Um, those are my two bits of advice I can impart at the moment, but there's a lot more. We go a lot more in depth in our presentation on this in the hive. So I want to talk a little bit about disabled innovators. Um, there's, a, you know, a lot of what we enjoy today that we call universal accessibility is thanks to people with disabilities. You know, Louis Braille created Braille. He needed a way to read and he thought other people should have a way to read. And so he created Braille. Um, text messaging was created by a person who was deaf and it now benefits everyone. In fact, most people don't wanna talk on the phone. It seems like more people these days want to talk on text. Um, in my experience, a lot of people want to talk to me via text instead of calling. 
I'm a good old fashioned phone user if I can, but of course, if someone needs text for accessibility, I'm all about using it as well. Um, wheelchair ramps were installed because of the advocacy of the physically disabled community. And of course, everybody benefits from wheelchair ramps. Um, they're a great place to put truncated domes when we're crossing the street. We have truncated domes at the ends of those ramps. Um, it's a great place for strollers to be, people who have wheeled luggage, people who have wheeled backpacks. It's just easier for everyone. Uh, people with other mobility impairments who don't use a wheelchair can benefit from using the wheelchair ramps. Extra capacity bathroom stalls were installed for people with disabilities, but they also help parents and children who need to use them and anybody who needs a little extra space for whatever reason, for whatever, they, um, whatever they're needing. We have family restrooms a lot of times now too for, for the same reason. An app and web page design really does benefit everyone. When you create a beautiful, usable website, um, that is amazing for everyone to use. And um, that's something I want to talk about a little bit. Web content accessibility guidelines are important, but those are just the bottom, the bottom floor of what needs to be done to make them accessible. Um, the more intuitive the site is, the more beautiful it is, um, it's much a much better experience. And that's something we're working on here at APH as well, making our resources very usable and completely accessible and also really nice looking. All right, so we're at the poll now. I'd love to know what APH resources can help you. And so I'll give you some time to kind of answer the poll. And I've launched the poll. All right. For those that need it, the question is also on the slide deck. And you can also put your answer in the chat. So your choices are one, Accessibility Hub, two, Connect Center, three, Miguel Library, and four, all of the above. And the Accessibility Hub has a lot of resources. It's going, it's going to undergo a, a transition. We're gonna change it up, but it's gonna still remain and have all the same resources that you've come to expect from APH. Um, many of the resources we're talking about uh, will have some information there about how to make documents accessible, things like that. Connect Center is a great resource to get all different kinds of questions answered in all different areas of life. And so I encourage you to, um, to use and the middle, how do you say this word? Miguel, Mitchell? Miguel? Miguel. Miguel. <laughs> That's what I thought, but I was like, it doesn't have a U. Okay, Miguel. <laughs> um, library as well. So um, definitely check out these resources too. So I'm gonna end It's amazing what JAWS will do to words like that. <laughs> You did have 76% say all of the above. All right, everybody knows um, about the resources. 13% cool. were with the Accessibility Hub, 11 with Connect Center, and zero with the Miguel Library. So we might have to do a webinar. We need to kind of educate a little bit about the Miguel Library. Leanne, do you want to give an overview of it briefly? <laughs> you know more about uh, it than Miguel I do. The Miguel Library has uh, resources regarding uh, individuals with vision loss and any items written about or by individuals with vision loss. This also includes a music library of music created by individuals with vision loss. There's actually quite a bit in there. It is truly a library and we are working on scanning and putting information in, but it sounds like we need to let you know what is available. So we'll work on getting a webinar just for the Yeah, weekend. I'd be happy to help out with that however I can. Now that we've identified the need, we'll figure out how to do that. Um, and so I've gone on to the next slide about APH resources. So as you know, we have a lot of these webinars. Um, and so you please keep coming to the webinars, giving us your questions, letting us know what you need, what kinds of information will be helpful to you. Um, we also have a lot of videos on YouTube, as you've seen. Um, we talked about the Accessibility Hub a little bit earlier. Connect Center, here's the email for the Connect Center, connectcenter at aph.org. Um, and that includes Career Connect about jobs. So there's also Family Connect, um, Career Connect, all different kinds of resources here. Um, and lots of different videos on our products on YouTube as well. And 
uh, as we, we talked a little bit about Career Connect, we talked a little bit about Family Connect through the Connect Center. And then we have Vision Aware, which um, is a, a, has a compilation of a lot of different resources on vision loss. Um, how you can do different things with vision loss, what kinds of um, resources are out there to help. And we just talked a little bit about the McGill Library, so we'll have to do a little bit more on that in the future. And we have our podcast called Change Makers. I was honored to be featured in that a couple months ago. It was great fun to participate. And as this slide describes a little bit more about you know, the history that's involved in the McGill Library, lots of stuff about Helen Keller. Um, and we have constant, I would say constant social media presence kind of showing you what, what we make available, different articles that we make available. All right, and this is the end of my slides. Um, I have a picture here of me and I have my contact information. Um, but I just wanted to find out if there were other questions that anyone had that we could potentially answer in the last little while because we have quite a bit of time left here. We have about 20 minutes left. Um, so just wanted to see if, yes, I saw Shelly talking about the IRA does some tours, museum tours, um, and there's gonna be one of the APH museum. I believe that's, to, to tomorrow, today? I'm not sure, it's coming right up on IRA. There's gonna be a feature of the APH Museum. And so they've been doing virtual tours um, during the lockdown and continuing forward now as things reopen, they will be doing that same thing. Can you go back one slide, Ty, so your contact yeah. information is available? I can. There, if you'll leave that. There we go. Good. One of the questions here was with text and picture recognition, do you personally prefer picture descriptions in the caption or the alt mm. text of the picture? That's a really good question. And I was actually talking with someone about that this morning because I was talking about um, the new version of the Apple operating system is going to have both. It's going to have where you can put alt text or you can put a caption. And so um, I think if, I think for usability, it would be great to use the alt text feature. So it's a standard thing, but I will say that's not universal. You know, it's not universal that everybody does that. I, I prefer having it there and I prefer not having it in the post. A lot of people put it in the Facebook post or the social media post. It's nice if you can attach it to the picture um, instead of just putting it in the body of the post. But we're so early in this evolution of people doing that um, it's important to have it somewhere. So learn a way to do it that works for you, um, preferably in the picture description, but um, you know, if, it, if it's a caption, then that's okay too. That's, that's, those are my thoughts, but I'm sure everybody has a different thought on that. No, it's interesting. I, I to have hear. a lot of different thoughts on that because I really enjoy description. I enjoy extra description. A lot of people want to know the bare minimum. And I like to learn all the different colors and all the artistic parts of how someone interprets the picture, but not everybody does. So I've seen some very detailed descriptions and I've seen some very, you know, minimal descriptions. <laughs> so I saw there was a, uh, are you going to go through the rest of the questions? I don't want to jump. Let ahead. me catch the one other one that I gotcha, caught. Gotcha. Um, so one person asked, another person answered, but I definitely want you to be able to chime in. The question was, I get overwhelmed with all the apps, programs, and devices. Mm -hmm. yes. What can I do to evaluate what might be right for the customer? And someone says, well, identify what the customer wants to do and only show those first. But I wasn't sure if you wanted to add to that. I think it's really important to put the customer, client, or student first and ask them kind of what, or work with them. If Either ask them or work with them, depending on your role. Um, ask them or work with them to identify what are their needs with this particular app um, and, and listen to them. I think it's really important to listen. If someone says, man, this is really difficult to use, I'm having trouble with it, maybe we find a different alternative. Um, if we find one that's what I call beautiful accessibility, then we use that one because it's great, it's functional, it's intuitive. You know, those are the important things. Sure, it might meet some guidelines about being accessible, but it might not be very intuitive or very usable. So I think some experimentation sometimes is needed to figure out what's the best solution. And yeah, and you can't, and you, it is overwhelming, you're right. You can't know everything about everything. So just try to, try to pick one and use it and see if it works. And if it doesn't work, then see if there's a, a resource to find another solution. I know that there's a, a, a website called Apple This, A-P-P-L-E-V-I-S, and it categorizes and catalogs and reviews all different kinds of apps. 
And so for those kinds of apps for Apple products, you can go there and see what blind and vision impaired people have enjoyed using. That's very helpful. I don't know if there's an Android equivalent. I'm sure there is. Um, I'm sorry about that. I'm, I need to learn more about Android. Um, <laughs> but I'm sure there's a website that catalogs and reviews all those different apps. And that would be a great place to start. Okay. But maybe learn from the experience of other blind and visually impaired people first. Might be a place to start. Okay. Talking about apps, websites. Do you think linked in is more accessible on the app or on the web? Huh, interesting. I find it more accessible on the app, but I often find things more accessible on the app because they're a little less cluttered. There's a lot of stuff on the screen of, on the computer versions of those, the web version, but on the app, it's a little more contained. You can still get to all the things, but you can do it in a more intuitive way, in more categorized way. Interesting. And so there might not be as many ads floating around, more little pop-ups floating around. There are becoming more and more pop-ups on smartphones, but they're still less common than on a, a web browser. So I think for me personally, I think the app works really nicely, but I don't know if that's everyone's experience. I will say LinkedIn has come a long way with accessibility. And I'm sure that has to do with, um, I think Microsoft bought it. And I think that um, the accessibility officer there is doing a great job trying to make all their resources accessible as quickly as possible. What are your thoughts about appliances with Bluetooth capabilities, such as washers, dryers, and other kitchen items? I think they're great. I love to use different accessible options. Unfortunately, they're not very common, especially if you're a renter. Um, you don't really find them very often, but I mean, if you're building a house and you, or you have the opportunity to upgrade, I think they're really helpful. I think sometimes the functionality can be a little bit limited, like you can only do certain things with your smart assistant. I will not name her, so I won't make everybody just go off in their house, but um, you know, you can only do certain things sometimes with the appliance. And so sometimes that can be limiting. You buy it thinking, oh, I can do every function with this using the voice assistance, but not, you can't always do every function. There are limitations baked into the different systems. So you have to keep those in mind when you're shopping and ask the questions you know, how much can this do? What, what functions can I control with my smart assistant? Um, is it just, cer you know, certain functions or, and it's interesting because when you go shopping for these items, most of the time, the salespeople don't really know. They don't really know what to tell you. Uh, they don't have experience using that. So they might have to dig a little bit to find it. And I encourage you to hold them accountable to do that. You know, hey, I'm not going to buy this until I know that it works. So we need to look into what this product can do uh, or and what its limitations are. But, I, but overall, I do like them. I think they're great. I don't have the opportunity to use them because I'm renting right now. I have used a, an Instant Pot that had uh, Bluetooth capability, but it did not hook to an assistant. Um, I have used the Nest thermostat, which is really nice. I was disappointed that when Nest got bought by Google, um, and maybe perhaps before that, but I, I learned it cannot integrate with Apple Home. So now I have to have Apple Home and Google Home on my phone to be able to control different things in my home, which is kind of annoying. Um, but there are other thermostats that are accessible that you can use with your Apple Home um, app. So it's all in one app, which, which is quite nice to be able to do. OK, the next one I might take. <clears throat> it says, how are the captioned texts delivered? I considered having captioned text. Uh, but didn't know how to access it for the webinar. Depending on what platform you're viewing this webinar on, you do or should have access to turn on the transcript or show that transcript happening, the sub subtitles happening. APH hires and pays for captions to be done live. And so that is our goal to make our webinars accessible for all. The text is, for the most part, meaning-based, taking as much information as possible and turning it into text with a slight delay. There are other types of captioned text. If someone has not paid for a captionist, some platforms allow you to turn on artificial intelligence captions. I will say they're hit and miss. Sometimes they catch great stuff, and sometimes they're terrible. Okay. Does that appear in a separate window if you want it to? Can it appear in a web web window, for example? 
it can appear in a web window. It can appear okay. below the text item. There's a variety of options actually that it can. That's wonderful. It, it makes it more accessible for anybody depending on what they need. It's great. Yes. Yes. Wow. Well, I'm trying to see if I can find the next question. You got lots of comments coming in. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of great app recommendations in the chat. Yes. We should. Can we save this chat? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. I will save it. You will great. have it. No problem. And we've had a couple of people ask for the actual PowerPoint. Uh, American Printing House for the Blind went through a recent update to Office 365. And when you do any type of updates to software systems, the accessibility usually improves, meaning you are able to do more things with accessibility. But when that happens, it also sometimes changes how you make things accessible. And one of the things it does that we are learning and you just need to learn is that now that we're using the 365 PowerPoint presentation structure to change it into a PDF, there's a few more bells and whistles and hoops to jump through. And we are working on that. It will be posted hopefully later today or by Monday at the latest. So hopefully you'll have patience with us. And that's a great thing to learn is that this is ever evolving and learning accessibility is a learning process for everyone and software changes and then we have to learn a new way to do it. So that's just kind of part of technology, technology changing. Okay, I'm trying to look. If I've missed your question, please feel free to drop it in again. There's been quite a bit of information back and forth in the chat, which is fabulous. Someone is saying Android seems behind in accessibility apps that the iPhone iOS apps offer, for example, seeing AI. Yeah, I don't have as much experience with Android. Um, I am getting a bike in the near future that apparently has an Android screen reader on the bike. So I'm looking forward to learning and talk back on Android on an Android device for myself. Well, Ty, I want to say thank you so much for presenting for our Global Accessibility Awareness Day. If you want to read out your email address, if anyone has any further questions for you. Yes, thanks to everyone for being here. Um, you can contact me at T-T-O-M as in Mary, A-S-I at A-P-H dot O-R-G. You can also send to accessibility at A-P-H dot O-R-G.